first of all, let me thank Megan Black uh, and the Canadian Craft Federation for organizing this event and for asking me to participate. It's, it's quite a treat for someone who lives on Salt Spring Island on the very far west coast to travel all the way to the east coast. It's a unique experience. I don't get to do it that often and I certainly appreciate it. Also, when I'm working away in my studio on my own, I often forget what a wonderful proactive craft community there is and how many things are actually happening in our field. So uh, meetings like this, chances to get together, to see old friends, talk about what's happening in the future is a really valuable and uh, wonderful event. So thanks for this opportunity. In my talk today, I'm going to reference my practice as a tapestry weaver as a means to explore the convergence of craft practice with the hallmark values that we might associate with an heirloom. Now, am I coming across okay sideways? Yes, good, okay, great. Um, which I think in relationship to contemporary craft, which is my area, I'm going to consider these to be investment of time, skill, and meaning. I'll focus on three points that I think are, um, uh, reflect what I'm, what I'm calling both the romance and the reality of my uh, practice. The role of tapestry as a signifier or a storyteller, and the reality of preserving crafts like tapestry as cultural heirlooms in public installations and collections, and a little bit about the idea of educating for an heirloom sensibility. Although I'm going to focus on my own experience, because of course that's what I know best, I anticipate that my experience will reflect something of the broader field. I'm going to illustrate my talk with images of my own work and of my studio, which we can see here with Studio Cat. Uh, in some cases, the images will relate quite directly to what I'm talking about, and in others, um, it'll end up being more of a general reference um, to what I'm discussing. Each uh, image of work will be identified with a title and date and size on the, uh, on the slide. Okay. Throughout my 35-year career as an artist, I've explored ideas that reference my experience of the world. To do this, I've chosen to work almost exclusively with the process of woven tapestry. And I've come to understand that I'm drawn to tapestry for a number of reasons. I am invested in the material presence of a tapestry, uh, and the development of imagery through the skillful handling of materials and process. I'm also invest, I'm, I also value the investment of time and attention to detail as an expression of optimism and as a counterpoint to the immediacy and temporal nature of contemporary culture. I'm interested in the continuation and the evolution of traditional practices that link the past with the present. Many of my concerns as an artist maker parallel what we might recognize as hallmark values of an heirloom, investment of time, skill, and meaning. And like an heirloom, I think of my works as objects with a past and a future. I rarely, however, think of my tapestries as potential heirlooms. I think I would consider an heirloom to be an object created through the very unpredictable alchemy of cultural worth, connoisseurship, family history, and personal experience. I do, however, hope that my tapestries function as a signifier or a reference point to what we might value in a cultural or personal heirloom, and that they link the past to the future. Skillful work, investment of time, links to traditional practice, materiality, and the arousal of personal associations are all intrinsic components in my work. For the purpose of this talk, I'm defining these concerns as an heirloom sensibility. And I would venture to say that this is a sensibility embedded in a, a number of craft, contemporary craft objects. Embracing an heirloom sensibility, I believe, is a romantic endeavor. It is impractical, it is idealistic, and it's highly imaginative. Reference to time is an important metaphor in the visual language that I work with. The succession of time and the accumulated weight of history and life experience are reflected both through imagery 
and through the slow accumulation of yarn in the weaving process. Within my practice, I've also come to value skilled handwork as a human-centered technology that connects mind and body to evoke a sensual connection of shared experience of making that can reach across history and cultural ideology. In 2001, I started the handwork series, To the Bone in the Blood from the Heart. In this series of small tapestries, I initially began to explore some new techniques that I, I rarely worked with. In doing that, my exploration of weaving processes stimulated thoughts about the value of discipline-specific knowledge and the meaning of handwork. This developed into a series of works that explore the social and cultural perception of time-intensive handwork and manual skill. For me, these works and others that I've done represent the idea of tapestry as a signifier of what I'm referring to as an heirloom sensibility. In the handwork series, I used images derived from anatomical and gestural drawings of the human hand and forearm. The hand has appeared in art since the earliest of human culture and is inseparably linked to, the hum to human endeavor and the achievements of material culture. I juxtaposed body images with reference to traditional or historic textiles. And through this pairing of hand and textile, I'm alluding to the dynamics of skill and disciplinary knowledge that has fueled invention for a millennium. The tapestries are presented as fragments enclosed in an architectural frame that suggests the presentation of an artifact. I'm trying to evoke a reference to a relic or maybe a memento, suggesting the possible and potential obsolescence of both handwork and the handmade. Through handwork, I feel linked to a continuum of makers. In fragment number nine, the one we have here, um, I chose to recreate a fairly obscure corner of a 17th century verdure tapestry, which is the very floral kind of tapestries that you see. Um, and I worked from an enlargement of, of the pattern area. The enlargement, when I was studying it, revealed what seemed to be a tiny flaw in the original tapestry, where the color seemed mismatched or awkward, something was just off, as if the weaver so many years ago had lost their concentration, as I do many times, as if they were distracted by something, a noise, something happening. I reworked the area, leaving my own probably flawed interpretation in the recreated image. But it was through this experience that I was reminded that in a contemporary culture which is dominated by the anonymous, reproduced object and the mediated and appropriated image, handmade objects stand for authentic experience. Like other constructs that are brought to life through the skilled negotiation of handwork, tapestries are infused with a sense of originality and authenticity. The material presence provides a direct link to the original act of making and circumvents anonymity for both maker and viewer. It's my intention to make a sense of time and the history of human labor implicit in these tapestries and to evoke reference to the long history that links material culture to the skill of the human hand. Tapestry as a process allows for the development of imagery with the potential for creating narrative inter interpretations and like an heirloom can draw out individual experiences, associations and memories. The works in an earlier series, the Memento series, are influenced by my interest in display and the collection of objects from multicultural sources. I gather together collections of objects that reference shifts of perception that occur as objects and people move between diverse cultural contexts. In the Memento series, I used objects or referenced objects that I had collected, that I'd received as gifts, or that I had inherited. And these are really objects that I feel can communicate more than their historic and cultural concerns. That one progress. No, no. Okay. These objects can be read as insignificant, trivial, small trinkets. 
However, the change in perception from insignificant trinket to talisman or heirloom embedded with power may shift depending on cultural and personal experience to imply more complicated narrative implications. Like Dutch still life painters of the 17th century, I believe that, the object, that objects can signify more than their simple reality. For me, the things we make and gather around us can record our lives in very meaningful ways. The tapestries in the Possession series explore the accumulation of accumulating, collecting, and displaying objects from material culture and the natural world. In this series, I am interested in human desire to possess and assimilate the natural world into material culture, recreating nature under human control by translating it into decorative pattern, systems of notation, systems of notation and collection. I've been influenced by 16th century cabinets of curiosity and later natural history collections that bring into question the relationship between knowledge and control and that reflect our continuing anthropocentric attitude towards the natural world. I use a compartmentalized composition to control and juxtaposition historic and contemporary tools, reference to botanical drawings, diagrams and mapping. I also reference historic textiles, emphasizing those that show evidence of colonialism and cross-cultural exchange, drawing parallels between the human urge to transform the natural world into material culture and the West's preoccupation with accumulating and possessing other cultures. Each tapestry in this series is marked with a human imprint on the lower right-hand corner, you can see. The narrative that's woven through this series of tapestries explores the impact of the human desire to possess and control our environment, our bodies, and our histories. In these works, I attempt to bring forward and make sense of the complications and contradictions of our history and the issues that we live with. By bringing tradition forward into contemporary culture in meaningful ways, the crafts link old memory to new feelings and are evidence of storytelling, both through the process, the story of making something by hand, and the sharing of ideas and experiences. These qualities of personal connection and shared stories have made craft objects ideal for personal and public collection. The stories that we tell through our skill and experience reflect a sense of place, and expressed values and issues that are linked to our culture and national identity. Canadian craft artists are creating works that embody the values of an heirloom and tell stories about our heritage and experience. But how do we ensure that these objects and the sophisticated knowledge that has created them will be passed to the next generation? How do we ensure that contemporary craft objects, like an heirloom, will have a future as well as a past. I'm just going to let you look at that work and slurp a little bit of water here. I'm getting such a dry mouth. The continued creation of contemporary craft uh, sorry emerges from that romantic engagement of the individual craft artist and the continuance of sophisticated skills. But the preservation of contemporary craft as cultural heirlooms relies on the very real impact of sustainable collections, public installations, and committed educational institutions. The commissioning of artwork for public installations would seem to be a highly accessible means for contemporary craft to be made available to future generations. I've enjoyed the opportunity to design and install tapestries in public locations. And although I'm very confident in the endurance of my own work um, and that it, will, it could exist in those locations for a, a considerable amount of time, I am often concerned that the lack of maintenance of public art Interior renovations, of constantly reflecting changes in taste and style, which suddenly make the artwork less desirable, it gets moved away, 
and even the decreased lifestyle, life, lifestyle, lifespan of contemporary buildings. There's buildings that I'm familiar with in Vancouver where there were great public art pieces. They're gone, there's a new building, there's something else. So our sense of time has changed so dramatically. Um, all of these things, I think, undermine the potential for multi-generational exposure for contemporary craft in those kinds of public installations. Public, corporate, and private art collections are also a means to preserve craft objects. However, across the country, we've seen many private and corporate art collections dispersed. I lived in Alberta during the heyday of the 1980s when corporations were buying art for corporate collections. The work was displayed throughout their buildings. It was housed in in-house galleries, staffed with curators, technicians. It was phenomenal. Um, two decades later, however, two decades or so later, I also witnessed the auctioning off of most of these collections as major corporations downsized and art collections and curators became very expendable. Civic, provincial, and federal public collections survive but funding to support new acquisitions, maintenance, maintenance and accessibility, I think, remain an ongoing challenge. <coughs> Public museums and galleries house contemporary collections, but I also believe contemporary craft objects are highly underrepresented in most of these collections. The reality of preserving our heritage, our contemporary craft heritage, for future generations may, in fact, be a little tenuous. To keep contemporary, practice, contemporary practices like tapestry alive, we are tasked with preserving traditional craft objects and practices for future generations. But we must also find ways to let these traditional approaches evolve and grow by drawing younger makers into a romantic engagement with skillful making and storytelling. So how do we educate to the next generation to embrace an heirloom sensibility? Art, and particularly craft education, is a very complex and multifaceted activity. After 32 years teaching in a, an art institution, I'm really aware of this. To remain viable, education in craft disciplines must provide the student with an experience which reflects and reflects on the diversity of contemporary art and on contemporary culture, the nature of contemporary culture, as well as providing history and theory specific to the discipline and the area of craft. Students must have technical training and access to a range of equipment and tools that will facilitate their ideas. And they need to be able to work in a curricular system that allows for sequential production and time-intensive processes. <coughs> As I consider the range of activity in the field of contemporary craft and the demands of maintaining a viable approach to craft education, a number of questions rise to the surface. What do we keep? What do we let go of? What do we add? And can we possibly do it all? These are complex questions, and I can only skim the surface here. However, when thinking how I would answer these, I come to the idea that, I, that it it's important that we have guiding principles. And from my point of view, these principles must be the continuation of a distinctive craft identity, maintained through a commitment to technical and academic disciplinary knowledge. I also believe that it's essential that the experience of making, hands-on making, remains at the core of craft curriculum. These are seemingly simple principles and will, I, but I believe will allow craft to develop through both practice and theory um, to maintain a distinct and strong voice as we move forward. Educating to allow for an heirloom sensibility that acknowledges the influence of traditional practice, values the investment of time and skill, and recognizes the potential for objects to tell personal and cultural stories does not exclude craft from the broader field, which is often the criticism. It doesn't, include, it doesn't exclude it from the, the field of contemporary art or inhibit the integration of new technologies into craft practice. 
Recognizing the distinct and specialized nature of craft practice need not lead to autonomous or segregated studio areas that are unable or unwilling to address hybrid practice or interdisciplinary relationships. An interdisciplinary research culture within post-secondary education is strengthened through diverse identities and relationships between areas of disciplinary knowledge. Collaboration, shared knowledge, curriculum flexibility, and respect for diversity create the dynamics for cross-cultural, ex cross-disciplinary exchange. If we are to recognize interdisciplinary practice as a position of equal exchange between disciplinary areas, a kind of distinct society of the arts, not necessarily a melting pot, then craft disciplines must retain a strong identity to continue to be well-placed to contribute to and engage in this dialogue. And I think it's also important to remember that an in-depth involvement with a discipline or even a single material can lead to a profound educational experience, leading to insightful and often very intelligent art. Discussion of traditional skills um, and skillful making as an aspect of the educational experience, I always find, inevitably leads to the relationship of craft disciplines to new technology. And often derogatory comments that craft education is easily mired in the past. From my experience, however, when working groups were called together in my institution, at least, um, to develop institutional plans for emerging technology, the first to arrive was always the craft areas. And even when conferences are, are organized, craft conferences, the, the proceedings are, are being planned, but it was all, it's often the productive interface of making with digital technology that's front and center. Craft makers, after all, have been using technology to aid in making for a long time. The negotiation of materials and ideas with the technology of tools is nothing new to craft practice. It's very much part of our sensibility. The integration of digital technologies, though embraced possibly by the studios, um, the integration into the studio areas is often stymied by an institutional either-or viewpoint that's wrong-minded and expecting that digital approaches can completely replace more traditional means of making. I don't know if my, my experience, it's the kind of, you can have that jacquard loom that costs however many thousand dollars if you get rid of the room of floor looms, that kind of either-or approach. It's an approach that completely misses the point from my point of view. For contemporary craft, it would seem to be the interface or the relationship between the human-centered, handmade, and cyberspace that's the most interesting. That's, that's what's engaging. What, what do these two things mean? And how do they define the objects that we're now working with? Budget constraints, I'm sure everyone's familiar with that, tend to be the root cause. Um, Craft programs we know are expensive to run. They need considerable physical space. They use really expensive resources. They require skilled technician support. And the development of mature skill takes time. Sophisticated statements that unite skill and concept don't easily fit into limited class times and the scheduling requirements of most undergraduate programs. The sustainability of craft as a contemporary practice in the future will, I believe, be reliant on in-depth research and research methodologies that continue to recognize the distinct and evolving characteristics of the craft disciplines. Methodologies based in academic research and on reflective studio practice will support and continue to interpret craft practice in a changing cultural environment. Like heirloom cultivars, those lovely ripe tomatoes, craft skills like tapestry will survive because there are people very dedicated to its survival and artist makers like myself fully engaged with the romantic vision of craft, of contemporary craft practice. But for craft to do more than just survive, for craft objects to have a dynamic presence in Canadian culture, and for craft objects to take a prominent position in Canadian art history, 
we will need to cultivate and assert craft as a creative identity and to continue to advocate for the recognition of craft makers and the preservation of craft objects as our cultural heirlooms. Finally, I hope that my tapestries will be seen as objects of expressive beauty and material skill, and that like an heirloom, they will encourage reflection on the past, engage us in the present, and make us look to the future. Thank you. Thank you.